So first of all, I would like to extend like a lot of thanks to these folks on the dais because they accepted a last minute invite to this panel. And before we start, uh, I want to take like a raise of hands as to who are the folks who are attending the State of the Map conference for the first time? Wow. <laughs> okay, this is a huge number and welcome to this conference and you know State of the Map. So one thing which is exciting or which is very unique to State of the Map Asia is the country uh, presentation. So traditionally, the country presentations were you know, representative from different communities or regions in Asia. They would come across and share what is happening, you know, the state of their region in that place, and what is happening, what's new, what are the new things that they're doing, the projects, the statistics, and things around that, and share it with everyone in the audience. This year, we're trying out something a little different. So we've got all of these folks who are you know, active community members, have been doing great work in their field, to come and discuss about the impeding issues and you know, conversation around this. Uh, as all of us go ahead, I would request each of them to go around and tell them, uh, tell about you know, their names, the country they are from, and one unique thing about their community that stands out. Not too much of explanation, just a line, but let's do this quick. We can start with Srividya. And one second, before we start, audience, I want every one of you to actually like, you know, make points and have questions ready because the last 15 minutes of this panel, we will have, you know, you all interact with the panelists to ask questions and everything that you have. So, you know, keep your mind all active, start making notes, and have all the questions ready so that, you know, we can make the most of this one art that we have. Um, hi, uh, my name is Srividya. I'm from uh, India. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, I don't think we have like, a, uh, I, I feel like uh, the unique thing is like uh, the state of the map happening because uh, this is where I feel like our community sh is beginning and people are starting to know that open state map is very important for India and like we should be building a community around it and data for it because uh, India has really like uh, bad need of data and this is the beginning is what I feel. Uh, good morning everyone. My name is Hari Mahardika. Uh, I am uh, working with a humanitarian open street map team or HOT in Indonesia and also the open street map user since 2012. So uh, yeah, what can I say about the OSM community in Indonesia? It's, it's developing now because we run a lot of uh, local project in Indonesia and uh, I have a session, one of the, our biggest project in Indonesia. So yeah, uh, I hope in this session I can share a lot of information about what our communities in Indonesia are doing right now and if you have any question please let me know thank you thank you Harry. good morning everyone I'm Irvin from the Philippines um, I'm glad to take part in this year's state of the map Asia conference uh, one of the things that are unique to our community the open street mapping community in the Philippines is how recently we've been dealing a lot with increasing diversity in all our mapping activities. So we have a high number of female to male ratio compared to what most tech groups are like. Um, so I guess that's one of the, the highlights uh, of uh, the community in the Philippines for OpenStreetMap. Hello, good morning everybody. My name is Nama Burdathaki. I'm from Nepal. Work for Kathmandu Living Labs. I actually don't have a good answer for your third question. <laughs> what is the outstanding, <laughs> you know? information about uh, Nepal ways and community, but I hope people might be able to enforce you know, certain information at the end of this conversation. Hello, my name is Taichi from Japan. And uh, so uh, I remember, so Obosumap Japan community was born in 2008, that is same in India. So we started mapping party and uh, mailing list and the website. Anyway, so yeah, this year is uh, 10 years anniversary for the, uh, our community too. And uh, now uh, I'm working as a teacher at the university and uh, I'm uh, extending to uh, open some community uh, for the more younger uh, people and students. Uh, thank you. Hello everyone. I am Irene Akhtar from Bangladesh. I'm a postgraduate student of University of Dhaka, and I'm a research fellow from Youth Mappers Research Fellowship Program. 
So basically, the unique thing uh, of our community is uh, many young people uh, are engaging themselves in mapping, and we are like motivated them to do mapping with from from many diversified file, uh, field. Uh, just like uh, if you are a student from CSE, you can uh, input your skill in mapping uh, through some program uh, or through some programming no language. So this is the uh, unique thing from our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayrin. So uh, I'll introduce myself. I am Jeenul. Uh, I am from the OpenStreetMap Indian community, but I've been interacting with all of you. and. As we go ahead, we've heard the word community a lot of times, right? So what is a community? Anything, I mean, the open source, I mean, the OpenStreetMap actually started with few volunteers. And when that threshold crossed, we became a community. So, you know, all the community plays a very unique role because it sort of becomes a support system. Um, not necessarily that we meet each other every day, but there is interaction and then we teach each other. And this is exactly what we're trying to do with this panel. And as I said, you know, like uh, when it comes to straight, like Asian community, it is relatively quite new. And, uh, you know, all of us feel and, you know, it, it's been a driving factor that the communities are, you know, triggered because of a, uh, a natural disaster and which got the community together. Uh, I would like to ask Irvin about this as to like, you know, he's been working with the Philippines community in and out as to how did that community grow, how they came together and give us an idea of like, you know, how does the bunch of volunteers become a community? Uh, I'm not really one of the earlier members of the OpenStreetMap community. I only started back in 2012. Most of, uh, most of the older active members in the Philippine community started around uh, 2006, as early as 2006. Um, how did we become a community? Uh, this is a tech. Initially, this is, was a technical group working something with technology. Uh, the common interest that bound us together was maps. I was involved in geographic information systems, so naturally I'm interested in OpenStreetMap. But the question of uh, how it became a community is more about tying together your interests about not just the maps, uh, building maps, but more about uh, what would I like to map? What are the things that I could add or diversify or improve that will work in areas other than the principal uh, activity of mapping. So the growth in the community recently in OpenStreetMap in the Philippines is about uh, tying personal initiatives and projects with uh, OSM as the main uh, mapping tool. Thanks, Irvin. So uh, uh, as a follow-up to that, uh, do you think that natural disasters, you know, bring the community together, or is that the driving factor around it? Or um, one of the earliest, uh, strongest uh, typhoon to hit landfall was Typhoon Yolanda, known in the Philippines as Ty Typhoon Yolanda or Typhoon Haiyan internationally, and that was uh, a watershed moment for the Philippines. That was back in 2013. Uh, OpenStreetMap never became as popular, never became as uh, uh, popular until after that time. People realized that open data, crowdsourcing, um, various groups working together to keep an updated map is possible even without the government or official agencies actually leading uh, the mapping effort. So 2013 for Yolanda, a crisis was turned into an opportunity by the OpenStreetMap community. And here, here, here today, it's so very different. Recently, we've had another typhoon. And without much funfare, we actually managed to uh, hit the number of mappers mapping like Haiyan back then. That's over 1,000 mappers. Wow, uh, that is great. Just adding to the point as to what you mentioned that, you know, it changed in 2013 as the community got together and there was, you know, the value of open data. Nama, 
we all know about uh, you know the Nepal earthquake in 2015, and that sort of you know brought a different dynamic to Nepal in general. Was there an OSM community before in hand, or and was that the factor that drove them together and you know brought them all together? And how is it right now? Like, is that getting stronger, or you know, <coughs> what is the motivation behind all of it? Well. Uh I don't know how, how to start this. Uh, I think um, I should tell you there was some sort of uh, less organized mapping going in Nepal even before 2015 earthquake. Uh, you know, Nepal is also a, a tourist country. There are I mean, so many people com coming from other countries, for trekking, hiking, and then uh, because this technology uh, came from the West, and many of these people probably know things ahead of us, and then they, when they come to Nepal, the map. That was there. But if you're asking about uh, a more robust community that, you know, lo from the Nepalese themselves, mm -hmm. I, I would say it, it started somewhere in 2011. Um, and uh, when uh, I returned back to Nepal from the North America, I started reaching out to to schools, colleges, you know, pretty much similar to how this thing starts in many countries. And that was going, actually we did a lot of mapping in 2012 and 13, uh, partly also because there was a project called Open Cities from the World Bank, uh, and, you know, we also need to understand some of these things. Uh, yeah, there are already people mapping uh, as, uh, as, as, you know, as part of their volunteering uh, contribution, but when there was a project and that thing just multiplied, and while we were doing, uh, and then we were hit by the earthquake in 2015, <coughs> um, you know, and then the things changed. And you, most of you probably know um, the biggest number of, the, you know, it was the biggest number of mappers who, 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 who mapped Nepal. Um, biggest number, in, I mean, in any major disaster. And then, um, you know, there's a quick spike, and again, nothing unusual that happens, that happened in the Philippines, that happened in, in Haiti, that happened everywhere. Um, actually more than 9,000 people mapped Nepal uh, in, during the earthquake. At that time that was the biggest number um, uh, in any disaster. But then after, uh, you know, the one challenge uh, is, you know, that this pack doesn't remain there. You know, that thing changes after disaster and that also happened in Nepal. And I would say uh, it went up and it came, you know, and, and remained somewhere. And then that number, good news now, is that it's, you know, it's increasing uh, in, in a pretty good way, in a more stable way, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, because of uh, different uh, reasons, I hope you will have other questions to address that later. So, uh, you know, short answer to your question, there was community before earthquake. Earthquake actually helped it to popularize, uh, actually took the message to our government. You know, it, it took the message beyond the mainstream OSM community mm -hmm. um, to the society in large. And that was uh, pretty helpful, uh, you know, to expand our effort after the earthquake. Thank you so much, Nama. And does anyone else have anything particular or with, you know, something that you would want to share when it comes to like, you know, bringing the community together in your region? As, you know, I go ahead, I think mapping parties or you know, mapathons is something which is a very common term for all of us when it comes to like you know getting everyone together and mapping. Now, after the disaster, and we've got the community activated, they are active on the map. And as Nama mentioned, that you know now there's a lot of activities that are going on. So that was a trigger factor. But now we have too many you know activities. How do we sustain this community? You know, like from 2015 to 2018, there's a lot that has happened. Uh, Harry, uh, he's uh, been contributing uh, or working with the Humanity and OpenStreetMap community in Indonesia and has a lot of experience around it. What are the challenges and what are the things that you have been facing when it comes to like, you know, sustaining these communities and getting them together? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, when in 2012 when I became uh, like a OpenStreetMap user, so I'm involved in uh, one of the project that's collaborate between the Australian government with the National Disaster Management Agency at the time. 
and we assist the local government to map their area in Jakarta. And one a problem that I, see, I saw uh, at the time is like uh, after the activities, there is no like a uh, follow-up activities. So yeah, that's it. You got the map, you, your area is complete mapping, and then what? So the, uh, the, the government only get the map, but doesn't have the, the knowledge of the real purposes of why, why we are doing those kind of activities. So from the problem, since join with HOT later, uh, so we always are uh, doing some uh, strategies, if I can say that, to try to retain the interest of the participants or, or the people who uh, involved in the project uh, to still interest after the project finished. So the first uh, activities, like a, we call it transfer knowledge activities. So this is the real important things because in HOT we don't want to make uh, only make a maps but we want to develop the people who make the map itself. So we want to develop their skills in terms of spatial knowledge and how to use the open street map. So we always doing what we call the follow-up follow up workshop after the, we finish the project. So the target is both from local government and also from the university, local university. So yeah, in hot Indonesia, Every time we do a mapping project, we always try to involving the local university because youth is a really good target if you want to uh, make it more reliable or sustainable program. So the second strategy is we make a module and documentation. So we create the methodology uh, when we're doing a mapping project. Of course, we want to some methodology how the project works. Uh, we have a team structure. All of the methodology we put it into documentation, both in English and Bahasa. So yeah, the, the people who are doing our workshop, after the workshop they can still read. If they forget the, the material or the knowledge, they can have a documentation that can read. And other technical stuff we make uh, like a, the, the maps we put it in the Wikimedia OpenStreetMap page in Bahasa as well, so they can see the, the output of the result and the activity. And the third strategy is uh, use the result uh, for the another purposes. Yeah, HOT, it's only, especially in Indonesia, we also, mostly our activities in disaster. But as you know, OpenStreetMap is for all. OpenStreetMap is not building only for a disaster uh, purposes. The data is for all. So, yeah, even though uh, after the project, the, the area is really completed map, but the purpose is not only for the humanitarian. So, yeah, for example, uh, our project in Jakarta, Surabaya, or Semarang uh, for disaster purposes, but also uh, used for the other uh, organizations such as Grab or Facebook, they also use the data for their other purposes, so that's still try to retain the interest. And uh, the last things uh, for the long-term uh, goals is to make the uh, legal institutional uh, organization. So right now uh, we can call it community, but community it's spread in a lot of cities without one legal organization can be really accommodate them. So since last year in 2017, we uh, made the, the OpenStreetMap Indonesia Association. It's legal, uh, government knows that. So we hope that we can uh, use that as a one big association who can accommodate the OpenStreetMap user or any open spatial data user. So our activities is not only limited because if you're using hot name, it's only limited in the humanitarian sector, but we want to use the open street map for the beyond the humanitarian, so for all people. I think that's the strategies that we use in Indonesia. Thank you. Thanks so much, Harry. Um, you know, bringing on to the point as you mentioned, right, the youth and the universities play a vital role in, you know, sustaining the community. Tai Chi has been working a lot with the university students. And you know, we'd love to like hear on your, your take on this particular thing and what are the initiatives that you're doing, what are the challenges that you faced in the recent past as to you know when you're training and how has that worked so far? 
Yes, so, yeah, Japanese uh, open space community, uh, they has uh, 10 years history, and I know, I think uh, there are three topics for that extending the mm -hmm. communities. Uh, so uh, one is, uh, uh, many people said, disaster, you know, uh, big earthquake and the tsunami happened in 2011. And uh, after uh, disaster, so uh, the community is very small. But uh, uh, after the uh, earthquake and the tsunami situation, so we provided a lot of uh, mapping data set to local people or gov local government side or Japanese government side. So uh, that uh, community uh, extending uh, in 2011. And second point is, uh, some uh, big company uh, donated the mapping data set to uh, OpenSmap. So uh, major uh, company name is Yahoo, Yahoo Japan. Yahoo Japan has a, uh, a very good road data set uh, in whole Japan area. And uh, uh, yes, uh, in 2011, same year, so Japan, uh, uh, Yahoo Japan company donated that data to OpenSmap. So we covered whole Japan area uh, with uh, high detailed uh, mapping data. Uh, and also, third point, so we, uh, uh, we made, uh, we have uh, made the good relationship to Japanese government. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there is, a, uh, the name is GSI, a Geo, uh, Geo, Survey, Geo Information Surveying Institute uh, authorities in Japan. And uh, now they are providing uh, we traceable, open map traceable uh, satellite, uh, sorry, uh, aerial photo data set or a map data set or something uh, as uh, the Creative Commons license. So that is uh, there three uh, topics. And so if we uh, have to, we want to uh, uh, continue as a sustainable community. So uh, that's these points, so uh, that project supported by the uh, OpenSmap community, mm -hmm. but they uh, changed uh, that position. So because in 2011 means uh, seven years ago, so uh, I was uh, 30, 35 or six <laughs> years. So but now I'm uh, 43 uh, years old. So I, my position is changed. Another uh, OpenSmap uh, community members changed to uh, more uh, good position, and that situation um, make the so those member activities so uh, change to down the so low uh, activity. So that means so we should get more new bees, uh, younger community. So. Uh, you said uh, university can provide more younger community for each year. So of course they will graduate, but so we sh can, we have to think about input uh, younger people and output as graduate students. But we can keep uh, four years or five years for this committee uh, and these activities. Yes. So that educational, university, high school, the educational place is very important for the sustainable activities. Yeah. Makes sense. And, and you know, as you, Nama, yes, please. Uh, well, uh, I, I think this question is pretty interesting in the sense that uh, it's, it's starting now to touch to humans uh, for me. Uh, you know, we, we always started in the OSM as a pretty much a mapping phenomena. You know, we, we, it, we use the language of map, 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 you know, produce map, map. But, but you know, OSM was started in 2004, it's about more than a decade. But now I think we more or less realize that it's not just a mapping or a technology phenomena, it's more a human, uh, you know. So why do people map or why don't people map, you know? Uh, you know, people have different motivations. Uh, uh, what are they looking for? And I think we, we do not fully understand uh, that area yet. But I'm glad that you know, we have increasing conversation about retention, 
understanding people, you know, uh, satisfying their uh, motivation, um, that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, so, uh, you know, my one learning is that unless we understand who these people are, you know, what does it mean by human, you know, what, what are people looking for? Why do people do certain things and don't do other things? If we begin to understand these fundamental questions, and then it will be a lot easier for develop, developing technology tools, engaging people in mappings. Uh, uh, so that's our realization. That's our, one of the learnings in Nepal. So um, you know, as we all know, in you know, where some people volunteer, that's pretty good. But there is only so much that people can volunteer. You know, people people have other things. They have to make their living uh, because we also have to be practical. Uh, and then, uh, what do you do now? And as a result, sometimes there are a lot of people they are mapping a lot, but then at some point, that's not the case. You know, we lose people. Um, so uh, I should mention one of the new initiatives we have taken in Nepal is, uh, you know, we're basically exploring a new model, mm -hmm. is what we call a dial, is a digital internship and leadership program, mm -hmm. meaning you identify a bunch of young people. Uh, so it's, it's our level, you know, beyond volunteering. You, you, you collect them, you identify them, you bring them, you give, we, we basically, we gave four days long intense in-person training. So they, and, and then they go back and they continue their internship, you know, like any other internship for the next three, four, five, you know, months, it depends. But in our case, it's generally three months. So during that period, we, monitor, we guide them very closely, remotely by the way. After four days they go back, they continue to map. They are given certain tasks. The task is defined, you know, uh, you know, after a discussion between their interests now, you know, in, you know um, the priorities. And then, but a close observation, close monitoring, close supervision. We designed that because for many people, they participate in the mapping party, they learn certain tools, and then once they go back, people actually cannot map, you know. They can map certain things, but uh, uh, you know, where SM is for me, you know, more complicated than many people think to really map uh, you know, in a rigorous way. So um, that's giving a better result because at least you do have these people with you for the next three or four months, yes. and then hopefully during that period, yeah, s some of them will have developed a certain level of passion, technical skills, passion. You know, they, they have time to fully immerse in the phenomena. And um, that's the idea. Um, um, so um, I would say we're doing pretty much similar to what others are doing, but, but this is probably um, a step forward. Um, we're also doing a journal paper on that. We'll be happy to share that with the community later, uh, you know, once, once, you know. We're, we're, you know let's see how the, the public in the journal says. Uh, um, so there are few early lessons. Uh, I don't have time to go through that. I just wanted to indicate. Yes, or um, I'd like to add that I, I agree with Nama about how most everyone in OpenStreetMap is normally introduced um, into mapping through crisis mapping. Crisis mapping has been associated with many of the OpenStreetMap projects. But what we realized, um, if we go back to the definition of what a humanitarian is, it's more about uh, promoting human welfare or advocating for social reform. And that's where we found our growth areas in the Philippines. After learning the technical part of mapping, they get into other things they're interested in. They're still into mapping, but they're ma mapping beyond what's needed for just like infrastructure or buildings. They, go, they get into the details, like there are now people mapping exclusively for breastfeeding rooms where women can uh, feed their babies, or people mapping uh, social facilities uh, exclusively dedicated for women. There are now people, at least in the Philippines, dedicated to mapping where all the fire hydrants are so that the local fire departments can have them in an open map, easily um, accessible from uh, commercial mapping apps like uh, Maps.me, Osman, or whatever you're using that consumes OpenStreetMap data. So growing OSM uh, goes beyond just learning the technical part of mapping, but getting into what's motivating them to map more or add data into OpenStreetMap. That's a great point, Irvin. As you know, like as he mentioned uh, that you know volunteers, uh, like voluntary, like mapping, volunteers mapping for 
you know, their hobby is in different things, but now OpenStreetMap has expanded itself far more beyond just a hobby project to, you know, having multiple stakeholders, like there are government organizations that are mapping, there are, um, you know, so many corporates involved who are interested in this data, and as Nama mentioned, that, you know, like extensively training them for like the span of four days and giving enough motivation for them to like pursue this ahead because there are far lying you know opportunities around where they can you know build a skill set and go ahead uh, it is very important to you know plug these in as we go ahead and grow the community and in particularly you know the factor that comes into play is the government as to like you know it's very important for mappers to know that that data has been used and we know one such example, and you know, Nama has been working with the government of Nepal for these certain, like you know, various cases. So, it is always hard, and you know, would love to hear your experiences around, you know, how is it, and what are the things that, you know, have been challenging, and what others could learn from that. Well, uh, one thing is that you know, uh, initially when we start with some community, we think it's, it's, a, it's isolated, it's a very different phenomena. Probably, you know, sometimes when I started with SM, I thought, you know, we, we, can, we don't need government. We can probably even replace some of the mapping activities they've been doing. But um, a lesson is that that's not the case, whether we like government or not in different parts of the world, but they are still the biggest institution in the country, and they, they are the one who can make uh, the biggest impact. I mean, we, we, we have to be <coughs> uh, realistic. Um, so now, um, so in Nepal, we started reaching out to government, engage them mm -hmm. uh, in the ASM. But then we have to understand the government's motivation is very different than you and my motivation, you know. Uh, uh, so how do, you, how do you, what language do you use to communicate this, this very complex phenomenon to these people? <laughs> uh, you know, that's, uh, and then what, what do they actually look for? Let me give you an example. So we've been working with human municipalities very, very closely with the municipal government. But you know, Nepal also did have an election last year after many, many years, local election after 18 years. So we do have new mayors with a lot of energy. But their motivation is not actually in map. You know, their motivation is actually to interact with the young people. Because these young people today, you know, they have influence in the society. You know. They have the voters uh, you know, for a variety of reasons. So um, then, um, you know, how can you align this mapping thing with the existing motivation? Um, you know, how can you plug in this thing? Uh, so um, we, we work with a couple of government, um, uh, you know, um, it, we, we produce map, of course, these young people produce maps. Sometimes they hand over the map to, to, to the mayor. And we also, by the way, we also do have a full presentation by Gaurav uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, you will be talking about this topic very extensively. Uh, please be there. I don't know which room you will be there. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in Nepal, we've been, we've been trying to work with the central government. Um, so we did have a keynote speaker from the National Planning Commission, vice chairman, we, when we had this conference in Nepal last year. Uh, we've been also working with the municipal government. And, um, I think that most of these governments don't have a, a, a capacity to produce map. Uh, you know, uh, they, they have very limited uh, technical capacity. So uh, that's an area that we can we can begin with. Hey, you don't have map, okay? Mm -hmm. But just talking, they won't understand. You have to be able to show them something. Number one, and number two is, and we can also tell them that your your young people, your citizens are there. You have a perfect opportunity to establish, uh, to to initiate a new conversation with them. That's exciting for them, you know, uh, 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 more than mapping. Um, um, but of course, there are, you know, issues. They begin asking a variety of questions like, "What is the quality of the map?" You know, everybody makes changes in OSM sort of things. Uh, um, but but I would say, uh, you know, um, we need to have some patience. That things do not have over, you know do not happen overnight with the government. If you if you just go, you know, at least in the case of Nepal, and I think that's pretty much similar in many government. Don't they expect? That I, I go and talk to government tomorrow and they will welcome it. Okay, come on, let's work. That will not happen. It will take time. So we need to have a very persistent effort. We need to get prepared for that. You know? and in many cases, in the OSM community, we do things pretty fast. You know, we don't, you know, we don't waste a lot of time in planning. 
uh, you know, like this this particular session. <laughs> you know, we, you know, that's that's at we, we assume that we were informed this morning that we have a <laughs> we have a panel. That's perfectly in line with the way the, 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 the fundamentals <laughs> of we assume, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so in, in, anyway, you know, there is some contradictions, conflicts. Government need a lot of time to think, to plan, to move. We want to move fast. We don't want to waste a lot of time, you know. And these are two different things. Um, but but we should be able to create some space in between these things. Um, but uh, my firm belief is that uh, you know, if we can engage government, we can probably address some of the largest questions that you know our keynote speaker, you know, the professors this morning just brought up. It because look at these questions these people are asking. They're not talking about map, they're talking about public policy, for example. Okay, you guys do mapping in WSM, that's fine. But how does it address the big societal questions, the public policy questions? We are not yet ready, honestly speaking, to answer that question, you know. Uh, partly because the whole phenomena is new. It's just about a decade. In science, in any new phenomena, one decade is nothing. Look at, you know, other things. And it takes centuries, you know. Uh, so, but I think we should slowly move towards that engage government, you know, research more, I think, and we could encourage IOM and other institutions to research. We do not understand fully what are the motivations of the government. How should we approach them? How should we engage them? These are very fundamental questions. We are trying our best, but there are more that we need to expand our, our, our understanding about. But there are, you know, certain things that we, 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 we have learned and that are indicated. Uh, um, so, but at the end, you know, I have found you know, good, good thing is that, you know, and a lot of governments are talking about smart cities, for example, you know, and then WSM very nicely plugs into that smart cities, you know, sort of global movement because the, the cities are trying to become smart. And sometimes I say, you cannot claim your city to be smart if there is no publicly available online map. How, how can that city be smart, right? And so we should we could probably make that argument. And the final point is that the, the there is a very strong message that we can package here to the government. You know, engaging young people, engaging citizens, uh, you know, opening collaboration between government and citizens, opening that conversation. I think governments are also in tremendous pressure now to be more open, to be more accountable, to be more uh, transparent, you know, responsive to citizens. And I think OSM brings a very promising avenues uh, 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 there and and in Nepal, uh, you know, we've been moving along that direction. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I stop there. Looks like it's pretty long. I mean, these are great insights when it comes to like the difficulties we face when we are, you know, dealing with the external stakeholders like government. But you know, and you know, these are great learnings for every one of us who are trying to like, you know, make this a thing where you know data is transparent and you have more people involved and all of that. Another stakeholder that comes into picture, I mean, especially when Harry mentioned about working with Facebook in Indonesia, we see there's an advent of corporates when it comes to like open data, and this is a great moment, uh, like movement for like everyone where you know we're encouraging transparency. Like Harry, do you have any, you know, uh, experiences when it comes to like as you mentioned, you were working with them. So what are, what were the challenges, and what what came into your mind when? This was, or when you when you were organizing these things, working with the the government. No, the as well, I mean government as well as like you know corporates because there's an as you said the data is not just used yep. by us but yeah. everyone around. So yeah. the challenges around that and yeah, the challenges is to to find some uh, similar uh, motivation about the, the open street map use uh, in terms of to 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 help people. So yeah, as you know, Facebook has a some motivation, yeah, in, in, in direct uh, advantage, it's the, the data, it's completed. But for the Facebook side, it's they want to use a free map. But I don't think it's really free because they, they also spend their uh, resources on the people. So they, hi they hire a lot of people uh, to maintain the data quality itself. So yeah, the challenges is, uh, yeah, for example, in Indonesia, so Facebook created yeah like a artificial intelligence who can track uh, via satellite imagery. They can automatically create roads, but roads itself it's not really perfect. 
So it's like a need uh, OSM user or mapper to fix the data. It's to connect the, the roads or the overlay buildings, uh, roads or something. So yeah, the, the challenge uh, is Indonesia is uh, not uh, land, one land. It's like archipelago country. So we have a uh, six big island and a thousand of uh, small islands. And it's kind of hard to validate all of those uh, works. So we pick up in uh, several uh, area and then we, we send a team to there to validate for a, a week mm -hmm. just to make sure what they are validate it's really good. But sometimes this is the, the, the problem if you uh, to rely on the machine. For example, in Indonesia there is a roads, which actually not roads, but it's only become roads in uh, summer. In the flood season, it's become a river. Oh. It's okay. not road. Yeah. So, uh, for example, another example, it's you can see it's like a, a separate roads. So it's like a there is a road. And there's an end of the roads, and there's a new road here. But actually, it's a one road. Why in the satellite imagery it uh, look like a two roads? Because there is a building. So it's like under the building, the roads. And it, you cannot do that, only rely on the, on the machine or uh, only validate by the people. You have to come to the, the fields. But the problem is Indonesia is too big to, to survey all the, uh, the, the area. So that's why uh, one of the solution is we, like I said, we collaborate with the local university. Every time we want to validate the data in there, we try to find the local university who are really interesting using the data, even though not, not only for the same purposes with us, but at least we can see this is map, open street map, it can be updated every time if, and you can get it every time if you need it. So yeah, they interest, they send like a 10, until 15 students. So we, before we really go to the field, we spend like a two days to train them, general open street map training, and then yeah, they can help us to validate the data as well. So we can spread a lot of people in a lot of area in the same time. I think that's the, 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 the story of our Facebook project so far. This is great. Um, and it's great to know, as, as you said, there's a motivation factor that binds every one of us to like, you know, get together and contribute to this map, which is not just limiting to us, but multiple stakeholders like you know, the government and the corporates and different communities and all of that. I'm going to be you know, a devil's advocate here. And as we talk about like, growing the community and everything, one important thing that comes into our picture is the diversity. I am so happy to see a lot more women in the auditorium compared to the previous conferences. And you know, you can see that it's going there. It, used, it, it, it wouldn't have been this way before, but then it's getting there. And that's when I you know, would want to point like, to you know, Sri Vidya and Irin in particularly to chime into this particular thing as to like, you know, when we are training or participating, how does <coughs> diversity play a role? And it does not just limit to you know, just mapping, but there are a lot of other things where you, know, you see pictures and like, you, know, you, you can say there's moderation, there's a lot bigger role that women are in, in the industry. And we, we clearly know that this community is not quite diverse. Mm -hmm. Let's acknowledge the fact that it is dominated, but what are the initiatives that you have in mind? Or you know, I would like the entire panel to chime in to give us an understanding of what are the things. And it's great to see so many women in the audience. Yeah, I was really happy in the welcome desk when I was like writing everyone's name. I was really happy to see a lot of women. And when I was like looking at the session and like speakers' name, I also saw like around like 20 to 30 percent are women speakers too. So it's like that's like you said, we are we are there. We are coming there. We are always like trying to be uh, in that. Uh, level where we are like comfortable saying that like we have enough diversity around us and whatever the map content or any decision making or anything which we want to whatever we want to achieve has enough eyes and like have uh, various types of thinking before we decide anything. 
Um, so like participation is the first step. Like everyone in the panel is telling like mapping is the first step. Mapping, like mapping starts with like someone telling, oh, you do you know OpenStreetMap? So that's like how you like, approach a person, like a participation. So like uh, I've been in a lot of conferences and have con con conducted workshops where like there are like some women, a lot of men and other gender like uh, diverse, diverse people. But uh, like uh, the way I'm seeing is like how many uh, and the conferences where I have attended, like the uh, the way I see is like there are really less Q and A's which comes from uh, non men background. So like most of the conferences, the videos, whichever I see, like the questions come from a men and not from non men. So like how that is the that is the initiation of like participation, right? Like asking the questions out loud in front of the crowd. Because when I have conducted a lot of workshops, I get like more one-on-one -on -one questions and like, okay, how to do this? Like, how did you do this? But like, why not in front of the crowd? So like, that's what the participation is. That's when they get the recognition. That's when they get the confidence. And that's where if you don't have confidence, if you don't have any of those, it's hard. So. Uh, I've seen like I, th I think diversity is not only the problem with OpenStreetMap because most of the free and open source software has the problem with diversity. Uh, yes. But like the most famous is like everyone's trying to tackle that issue, and like I'm really happy like GNOME GNOME's outreachy project is actually like giving a lot of uh, space to the non-men group to actually contribute to the like other parts of uh, free, free and open source software. So like the kind of initiative which I would like to see is like women only conferences and like the women only workshops, women only mapathons and like most of that like which creates that safe space around them and then they are ready to fly out. So that's where like I'd see like we will get more eyes because women is looking for that safe space and if they don't feel like it's not a safe space, they never speak up. I mean, I think on to the point that you mentioned that, you know, creating safe space for women and, and you know, having initiatives that, you know, uh, get them or give them that platform to jump in. Irene has been working with youth mappers and uh, training a lot of folks. So, you know, would you like to share what are the things that you keep in mind or, you know, what everyone has to like learn from your experience that they can, you know, bring it on to their community and increase this group of people and have a more diverse community? Thank you. Actually, I want to share my experience with youth mappers, you know, uh, what she said that about women in engaging in mapping and all that. So I have been uh, in youth mapper re uh, le leadership program and uh, research program. I'm a research fellow now. So I currently I'm doing a research uh, on uh, women vulnerability in the cyclone disaster. So when I go there in my particular area, I was surprised to see that most of the people are so illiterate and they don't know how to like escape in during uh, any kind of disaster. So that was so uh, unexpected for me because I want to uh, reduce their vulnerability actually. Uh, uh, so. Uh, when I have been there, uh, I saw that they are um, so insecure and they don't know how to, actually they don't know how to communicate with other people, you know? If I go there home and they just like, uh, I don't want to talk to you, <laughs> something like that. So if, I, if we want to encourage women in any kind of work or something, then we actually have to focus on remote area first because we develop the mega city and we are developing the cities area but we forget about the remote area. So there are a lot of people we can just make them effective for the mapping or they know how to, uh, what is the um, consequence, they know about their area, their particular area. Uh, if I go there from uh, like Dhaka and I don't know how to communicate with people, I don't know the roads and I don't know about their con condition. So uh, if we want to just, uh, if just we involve them in mapping, they can contribute effectively, I guess. Because um, uh, from the satellite image, we can see uh, barely about the area and then if we just, uh, 
add the data, um, particularly in this area. So basically, I, I would like to say that if we want to uh, build the capacity of a particular community, then we have to have that particular community and make them more involved in mapping so that they can uh, contribute by themselves. Um, if we focus in some remote area in our country, so uh, there, will, uh, there will be so many people uh, sitting ideally and they don't know how to involve their in some work or something. So uh, if just uh, we encourage them to, uh, that you can do something for people, you can do something for your country, they will, uh, they will surely uh, involve themselves in mapping or something else so that they can contribute for their country. Um, uh, we, the, uh, we, in our country, we have four youth mapper chapters in the university sector. So more educated people are, encouraged, are involving in mapping nowadays. And we are just doing this because more people involve in map, more people do the map, more the uh, contribution will increase and we are going to like make the changes. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is, a, yes, all right. I just want to add um, uh, our experience in the Philippines about improving the female to male ratio in our, our activities. So we have, uh, like wh what was said earlier, it's very important for, for women to feel safe in, in whatever activity or environment that they, they are interested in doing. And we found out that this is only possible if we make positive affirmative actions towards that. It, it will not happen naturally. Natural will happen like it will be mostly men, um, but without doing anything about that, um, the, the growth of the community will, will not be as diverse if no affirmative action is done towards that. So that's what we've been doing in the Philippines and we feel that there's some success but because we have now more female mappers, not just mapping, but also organizing their own mapping activities. So we, we try to support those, those activities by staying in the background. As you know, you mentioned the point about like mentoring, you know, I, I think you get to that point as to like having affirmative actions and uh, thing and that's when the whole role of, you know, mentoring comes into picture. So you know, there are, uh, something because I have seen you, you know, you've come into OSM and you've had that experience and you've encouraged a lot of other people also join OSM. What are the, you know, the factors that you consider are a barricade? Is it, as you mentioned in the past that, you know, the, the, prob the possibility of like, you know, bringing uh, the the confidence to just speak out. And so like uh, the first thing is like um, we, we should be like we, everyone here we all love maps like and I'm sure most of us have a unique story of why we lo love maps right and like we should find a way to like motivate by sharing our stories of like how like what drive us into the maps and what and like identify another thing in the uh, a person whom we are trying to encourage or motivate them to map to like identify that. So like that's motivation is like identifying what the other person likes. And then that's where like, okay, so this is what the person likes. So this is what you like to do uh, to attain that. So these are the steps. So like start mapping, understand the data. And then like there's so much to do around like uh, open state map data is just not mapping. Like you can do visualizations. You can actually like uh, in the keynote, you can say like you can actually visualize and like give a broader and like bigger uh, a perspective of like how it is in influencing people's lives and everything. So like that's what like they can uh, get into it only when they understand like how to uh, read the data or uh, everything. So like first is the, the best and the first is what I see is like seeing that motivation on like what they want to like what what is driving them to like start with maps. So that's if that is like figured out and then rest of them like it's really easy steps. These are some amazing and great points by everyone in the panel. Uh, before we head on, you know, for the questions and open it for people, like just to give a brief summary of, you know, 
how the volunteer, a bunch of volunteers get together to form a community where, you know, there have been mentions of a natural disaster, or crisis mapping being one of the factors or a motivation to get them together because that is very, I mean, it's important and the whole idea of the data being used by not just one or, you know, by just not the volunteers but different stakeholders and that being one of the motivation factors for having more community members involved in mapping and, you know, getting all of them together plays a vital role in bringing and sustaining the community. And as our fellow panelists like mentioned, the fact that, you know, uh, we have to build that platform which is safe for the, um, you know, not just the, I mean, make it more diverse, but also make sure that that's something that's considered and, and behind on top of your mind when you are, because uh, the, the natural thing is for everyone to like jump in, you would have more men, but having that consciously and thinking about it through our initiatives, activities, workshops, and special, uh, especially catering to that audience would make a huge difference and give a better perspective to the community. Thank you so much uh, for uh, you know, helping us understand, uh, sharing your challenges, sharing your experiences. Uh, before, I mean, and now we're going to the audience. I'm sure they have a lot of questions. Uh, and would love, I mean, would, it would be great to have you all there. And we can rotate the mics. Anyone has any questions? Yes. Yes, okay, sir. Um. Uh, good morning, everyone. It was a nice panel discussion covering how the, uh, different aspects of community building. Uh, as I think about how I use my maps in my day-to-day -day life, I have, although I, am known, I have uh, known OpenStreetMap, but uh, I have been using Google Maps daily for my day-to-day -day needs. What does the panel think, you know, can OpenStreetMap ever get there? And I also contribute because it gives feedback, okay, I mean, this information, can you verify something? I, I, I engage on a daily basis. I, when, is it possible, no, or um, what does it really take for OpenStreetMap to really reach that level? Yeah, to iterate on the question, uh, is that, you know, a Google Maps, I mean, he's been using Google Maps day in, day out. What does it take for OpenStreetMap to get there and, you know, become the map that people use day in, day out? Yes, Harry. Just want to share. Uh, yeah, every time I introduce the OpenStreetMap to, to the, the other people, that uh, actually I say the OpenStreetMap and the Google Map have a same, similar. Uh, it's you, you, you use Google Map free. I mean, if I am from the airport to see the this Institute India of Management using Google Map, I don't uh, spend any any uh, money. But the difference is, I always said that. To, to ensure that the OpenStreetMap has some advantage uh, than the Google Map is because the data, it's, there's no one own the data. I mean, for, for, for the, the data itself, it's, you can use the data. Uh, for example, uh, HUD uh, doing a lot of mapping project in Indonesia, but everyone can use the data, uh, the, the result of the project. And the second one is you, we can always update the data. The, the spatial data, it's very dynamic. Nowadays, because uh, a year, year uh, last year there is some uh, field, green field in my area, and today it's become a convenience store. So it's just a small example that how we can keep the OpenStreetMap it's relatively up to date rather than Google Map. Yeah, maybe another. Um. Okay, see what they wanted to pitch us. Um, uh, like everyone, even Google has like a local mapping community. It's not like they just got the data overnight. So like that, they built the community and community came to know what to map, what not to map, how to map everything. And that's how whatever we are using the Google Maps or OpenStreetMap, it's, uh, it's always built through the community. So like what I see is like the way Google built the community, we should be also building the community and passing the torch so that like we will always have people to update like the newest changes around, our, around us. So like the way I see, I remember reading it somewhere, like mapping is always a journey, but the community is always a destination. So like the destination should be like, we should always change the destination to, and passing the torch to the younger generations, but mapping keeps changing and we should not be depending on the mapping, but be building the community behind it. There's a question. Um, oh, open to, do you want? 
Or we could let, take a let me just add something. Okay. So as with any other maps, there will always be issues about completeness and accuracy. Um, the main thing about OpenStreetMap is that you can actually fix it yourself if you find issues. If you find anything missing, you can add them yourself, and it's instantly it will be on the map and not moderated by somebody who's working remotely or who may not even live in the same community you are in. So that's one big advantage for OpenStreetMap over Google. Thank you. Oh, hi, my question is for Erin. Uh, we didn't get to hear much about Bangladesh, but uh, you mentioned something about mapping remote areas, focusing more rather than mega cities. Uh, so from my understanding, Bangladesh is a very riverine uh, nation. Given that, I would assume that people have uh, an intrinsic knowledge of the land, and they would understand navigation without maps as well. How do you think we could probably leverage that, the understanding of local people, and get them involved in mapping? I mean, when, because uh, when you were speaking, I think you mentioned that uh, uh, there was a disconnect even while trying to uh, get someone from a remote area to map. So how do you think we could leverage that intrinsic knowledge of the land? Because, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Actually, particularly, um, if you go a remote area, they won't understand your uh, language. Uh, actually, not language. They won't understand English. So if you want to communicate with them, you have to talk to Bangla in Bangladesh. So. There comes something like map in native language, I guess. You, uh, like, you have to use map in na native language because people will like, just don't understand map, don't understand uh, how to use it, don't understand how to go from here or uh, nearer places. They actually, if you focus on like, uh, women and children from remote area, they can find in houses. So, they don't know about the map actually. So if you want to help them, you have to communicate with them in their languages, I guess. So if you want to communicate them, you just go there and tell them this is the way. But uh, that is not possible for everybody. If I do that every time, I can do that. You can do that. Nobody can do that. So what what is the solution? Solution uh, may be something that uh, you know, capacity, capacity building among themselves. Uh, like, uh, let them know about the map. Obviously, that should be bang in Bangla because they are Ill illiterate. So, uh, basically, when I went there, I found that more people are uh, like, uh, don't want to know about map. That is the main problem. If you want to encourage them, then uh, like uh, you can tell them that this is the map you can uh, communicate and you can do this uh, you can go there alone but uh, when it comes to the gender that she said uh, women empowering so uh, you have to just focus that you let them know that they, this map will help you when disaster come when disaster come you just use the map in your language or in native language so that um, you go to the safe shelter and you can save your family. So that is the way. I guess uh, this is your answer of your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Aaron. So we have room for one question. We are almost on time. So one question and we will close it. And then you can have conversations with each of the panelists individually. Thank you. Uh, so my question is uh, I mean, specific to Mr. Nama, sir, I guess. Uh, I'm working on urban uh, like integrating uh, civic technology, GIS technology for urban governance in Hyderabad. So where do I, where do I get stuck is uh, when I'm thinking about the quality of data. We get a lot of quantifiable data. But when I'm thinking of, like, I can give a small example. We, have, we were working on parks in Hyderabad. But uh, I know that many of the parks there are uh, dump yards around the park, and they're, st and they're stinking. How can I integrate such quantity, I mean, quality in a quantity, of, in a data which basically gives quantity? If I can add, uh, maybe it's, uh, it adds to the previous question also. How can local intelligence of people can be integrated into our maps so that quality is also uh, focused upon? Thank you. So you, you, if, if, 
Let me make sure I correctly un I understand your question yeah. correctly. So you're asking how can we integrate the local, the intelligence of local people, their knowledge. In uh, like what I feel is local people do have the information about quality of the data. And uh, when we map and we get information uh, when we are working, we got the information about maps and all from the government. They gave us a quantity of number of parks in the um, city, etc. But I think that local people will have got information it. about quality. So got how can we integrate it. that? Yeah, got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, <coughs> that's, that's exactly what OpenStreetMap is. Uh, because this is open, and we believe that you know, one person's knowledge or intelligence of uh, you know, one person is insufficient you know, to complete the task, in your case, producing a pretty good uh, park map. So um, I understand the government might have a data about the park, and that data, if they collected 10 years ago, probably is outdated. Um, so your government has to update that. That's very costly for them. Um, but the many governments, what they do is they put that data in an open domain, like in open street map, you know. So there are many local governments in the world, they've been doing that. So they have certain data, they put the data in open street map, and they call, you know, they ask citizens to improve the quality of the data. You know, update data, improve the quality, you know, because no data is perfect. Even government know that. And then, um, because the citizens are there in the community, you know, they know things much better than the government. And they ask citizens to improve that. And in fact, there are several governments that are doing that. You know, um, for example, New York City has done that a lot. You know, you p New York City puts data in open map, and then citizens improve that, you know, data. Improve quality, you know, improve, you know, add new features. And then the city, city government has they have developed some tools that alert them. Okay, somebody put new information in that particular park, for example, you know, the government knows that. So that's, you know, you know that's perfectly what open is, you know, that's, that's the purpose. If there is no data at all, we start, we start engaging people to, to map from scratch. If there is already some level of data, you know, it's a good idea to just improve, you know, put effort to improve that. So uh, what you've been thinking is perfect. Yeah, just do that. All right, so we're going to close this panel down. So thank you so much, Rividya, Harry, Irvin, Nama, Daiji, and um, you know everyone around for like listening in and contributing to this. Uh, thank you so much, and a round of applause to all the panelists here for joining us very last minute. <laughs>